with our speakers today, Sinead O'Neill, and 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 Sinead
<laughs> but you see it. And then um, I guess overall, if you get the fellowship, um, the most of the burden will fall on you because you're getting paid two days a week to do it. But of course, your, te your core viewers or your team, if you do ask them and send them drafts and stuff, should get back to you. Okay. But you'll be making the deadlines and completing it essentially. So once you have your uh, review team, um, the next thing is to actually identify a copyright title or a topic. And this was definitely the hardest part for us because you can go on to the Cochrane Library and look at all the different titles that are there and then you might see, oh, has it been done in pregnancy and childbirth? And it has. So finding a title that hasn't been done is the hardest thing. And I think in the end, Ali, we were like, we have about two weeks yeah. to get a title. It was a tight deadline. So um, to help you try and find the title, first of all, do look at the Cochrane Library and you might see on another uh, group a title that's been done and then check in your discipline uh, and may not have been done so then straight away maybe contact your group and see if the title is available. It's a good idea to talk to other Cochrane review authors or researchers because they may have ideas or they may know a title that um, they want done like a priority title. And then if you go on to the Cochrane website as well for each group they generally have a vacant titles list so just in this example, that's for the skin group, and they had a list of vacant titles that they wanted done. But these aren't updated very regularly, so again, just contact the group and see if it's still available, and that might help. Um, for me, mine was a priority review, so that's how I got my topic. So if you contact the specific groups and ask them, they may have priority reviews that they want done. And just in September, they uploaded a list of priority topics. So that's the link. And if you just click on that link, there's an Excel file there. And there's a list of all of the uh, topics that are available. And some of them are new reviews, and a lot of them are updates. So if you are wanting to update an existing review, the Cochrane Fellowship, they're not that keen on it. But you are allowed. But they want you to really justify, like, what's going to be new in this updated review. So ideally, if you could get a new topic, it's best, but you can do an update also. Okay. Yes. Come in. Um, I forgot to say, if anyone wants to ask me anything throughout, just stop me. Um, so once you've got your review team and you've got your title, you have to actually register your title with the appropriate uh, Cochrane Review Group and you need to complete a detailed title registration form, okay? So it has to be registered and approved before you apply for the fellowship. So you cannot apply for the fellowship without having a title registered <coughs> and approved. And you must complete a title registration form um, and this will be sent on to you by whatever group you go with. So for me, it's a Cochrane Pregnancy and Childbirth Group. And just to mention on this title registration form um, that you intend to apply for the HRB fellowship and that you need to know the outcome, you need to know that your title is going to be registered before the deadline. So the deadline for to apply for this fellowship is May 2017, the end of May. So this is just an example of the title registration form. Um, they may vary depending on the group. This is the pregnancy and childbirth one, and it's pretty detailed, but Everything that you fill in on this, you can then take and transfer to your um, online application when you're applying through the HRB system, okay? So the first thing they want is your title, and they have a standard format in um, Cochrane, so an intervention for a health problem. So for mine, it was different insulin types and insulin regimes for pregnant women with pre-existing diabetes. So we're basically looking at different types of insulin that women take and the different ways the insulin is administered in pregnant women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And you just put down your contact person. Then they want to know uh, why are you writing this review? Basically, why is it important? So again, when you do the online um, system for the HRV, this is a good thing you, you want to justify why your copy review will be important and why they should fund you, basically. So for us, diabetes is increasing everywhere uh, worldwide. It's the most common pre-existing medical complication in pregnant women. 
pregnant women with diabetes have worse outcomes than their non-diabetic counterparts. Um, for example, preeclampsia is three times more common. Uh, macrosomia, which is um, basically a very large baby, greater than four, 4.5 kgs. And then it's uh, silver, a miscarriage, more common. So pregnant women with diabetes have worse outcomes. And then the <coughs> insulin requirements can change during pregnancy. And at the moment, there's no uh, set criteria or no standard treatment for what insulin is best or how to give insulin, what's the best way to give it. So that's what we argued that our review was important for. So then in your sample, in your type of registration form, you just have to fill in a background section. So I just put in bullet points of what we had. So we defined diabetes, that there's type 1, type 2, that it's increasing prevalence, and particularly in young women of childbearing age, which is important. Um, and that the successful management of insulin requirements is pivotal to obtain uh, optimal pregnancy outcome. And because there is no set criteria or um, treatment for uh, diabetes, that we need a review on this, basically. So that was our background. Then you have to give a clear objective of what your review will look at. So for us, it was to conduct a systematic review of randomized controlled trials comparing different insulin types, which there are many, short acting, fast acting, and so on, and different insulin regimes. So you might have once daily injections, twice daily injections, and so on, among pregnant women with pre-existing diabetes. You just have to give a clear objective of what you're going to look at. Then you have to say what types of studies you're going to include. So generally it's randomized control trials. And um, we didn't have any language or publication um, restrictions. And for this review, we excluded quasi-randomized, plus randomized, and crossover trial science. You need to define your population. So for us, pregnant women, with pre-existing diabetes, so type 1 or type 2, and we excluded women with gestational diabetes. Okay. This was probably one of the hardest parts of uh, filling out this form because as someone who's uh, not a clinician or not a diabetes expert, coming up with the interventions and the comparisons was tough. So for us, we had a comparison. Our first comparison was similar insulin regimes with different insulin types. So we compared the basal bolus regime, but then it was different insulin types. So basically, in pH insulin compared to glargine insulin. Uh, so that was our first comparison. Then the second one was comparing different insulin regimes but using similar insulin types. Uh, so twice daily regime compared to four times daily regime. And then our last one was different insulin regimes and different insulin types. So you might have a biphasic insulin injected twice a day compared to a basal bolus regime of NPH insulin given at bedtime. So this is the hardest part uh, if you're not an expert in your review area. Outcomes, you're allowed um, a maximum of two primary outcomes. And then this again is where your review team will come in. So like uh, the obstetrician and the midwife in particular on my review team were able to advise me on what were the two primary outcomes they wanted to look at. And then you can have, uh, there's no limit on the number of secondary outcomes. So the primary outcomes is fitted into outcomes in the infant and in the mother. So for infants, it was macrosomia and perinatal death. And for the mother, we were interested in C-section and preeclampsia. Secondary outcomes. We ended up having 10 infant outcomes in total, uh, including um, fetal anomalies and admission to the neonatal unit, birth trauma, and so on. And for the mom, we had 14 secondary outcomes, um, including perinatal trauma, postpartum hemorrhage, retinopathy, and the list goes on. So these are all things you have to think about when you're submitting your <coughs> title registration form. Then you have to think of some subgroup analyses that you would do if, uh, if you're successful and you get to do the Cochrane review. So I guess for this one, an obvious one was type of diabetes, uh, type 1 versus type 2. 
gestational age when the women are recruited to the trial, so maybe less than 12 weeks pregnant and after 12 weeks. And there was a BMI and uh, maternal age, so maybe mothers less than 35 and older than 35. And just uh, remember that these, these probably will change when you actually go and start your Cochrane protocol. This is just to register the title. You kind of have to think through basically all the different sections. And then there's an other information section, and this is where you should definitely mention that you're going to apply for the HRB fellowship. So for us, we just wrote a little statement saying that we intend to apply for funding on the Health Research Board, and as part of this process, we are required to provide written confirmation that our title has been registered with an appropriate Cochrane Review Group. And if the Cochrane Pregnancy and Childbirth Group deems our review title is appropriate, we will require written confirmation of the trial title registration from the managing editor and just put a deadline. And I put it like a good week in advance of the actual grant deadline. Um, so just make sure you mention that you are applying for the fellowship and that you need to know whether your title is registered or not by a certain date. Then just some of the other little sections are you have to go and look if there's other similar uh, reviews but that don't overlap or aren't exactly the same as the review you're proposing. Then there's an author responsibility section where you basically state who's going to prepare the review, maintain it, update it, and so on. But again, this can change and it will change. Um, and then the signature conflicts of interest. Um, funding, again, here you could mention about your intent to apply for the fellowship. And you have to put in proposed deadlines these will change as well, but generally they'd say you'd have the protocol done within kind of six months and that the review, the full review would be completed within 12 months of the protocol being published. And then the final part of it is information on the rest of the review authors, so you just put in some expertise that they have that are relevant to the application, a short CV, maybe half a page, um, and the roles and responsibilities. And just remember that registering your title can take up to two months. So ensure that you pick a title, complete the title registration form, and coincide with the Cochrane Review Group meetings where they actually approve the titles, because some groups don't meet every month. So you need to find out when they're going to have their next group meeting as well to make sure that your title is approved. Um, and then the final step is, so you, you have your team, you have your title, and you have your title registered. You can then apply online on the HRB grant system. So um, first piece of advice is read the guidance notes. They're detailed, but they will help you, so the link to that is there. Um, they basically go through the objectives of the Cochrane Fellowship, the scope and the expectations. There's detailed eligibility criteria. Um, funding details, basically what you're funded for, how applicants are assessed, and then the, the different obligations. So every year you have to do a progress report. Um, you have to do certain trainings, so there's certain courses that you have to do as part of the Cochrane Fellowship. And then you have to basically agree that you're going to update the review every 18 to 24 months. So just the eligibility criteria um, on the guidelines for this year anyway. You have to be living or working in Ireland. Uh, you have to have a title registered with the Cochrane Group before you apply. It's a training fellowship, so you can't have the protocol. You can't have a title and the protocol published or anything like that. You have to be starting basically from scratch. Um, PhD students and MS MSc students can apply, but once you're not, like in the last few months of your master's or PhD. Um, they do allow you to update existing reviews, but you must demonstrate what it will add, that it will add a substantial <coughs> amount of new information. And then you need a local supervisor uh, with experience, um, but you can have a supervisor that's abroad, but you have to justify how you will arrange meetings and how this relationship will work out. And then co-reviewers, you can have as many as you like um, in Ireland or abroad. And then you also need support from your employer. So basically you need a letter from your employer saying that they will give you the one day a week or the maximum of two days a week off to work on this review. And then you must pick your host institution. So for here at CCC. 
Anyone have any questions or no? Okay, so this is the online system. Again, the link is there. Um, you just need your uh, email and password to set it up. And the different things you have to fill in are your basic details on the lead applicant, um, so name, email address, telephone number, and so on. Then you just have to uh, fill in if you're your profession, uh, if you're a member of any professional bodies, uh, your education, so put in whatever your degree and master's and so on. Uh, any previous positions you've had, any work experience and so on. Um, your funding record, if you have any funding to put in there. Uh, and any publications that you have, you add these into the system. And then you choose your host institution, so for all of us here, so it's UCC. Then you come to the review summary part, and this is where you take all the information from the title registration form that you have to complete in advance anyway for the Cochrane Group. So you have your review title and your review summary. So here you just provide a brief summary of what you plan to do. So for us, it was just saying stuff like diabetes is the most common pre-existing complication in pregnancy, that we wanted to look at the different types of insulin and the different insulin regimes. And you state a clear objective, so you can pull all this from your title registration form. You then have to outline your interventions and your comparisons. So we've got all our comparisons there. Who your participants are going to be, so pregnant women with pre-existing diabetes. And then your outcomes, uh, where we split into infant and maternal, but then you have primary and secondary as well also. And I guess one of the most important sections is why it's important to do the review. So for us, we said, number one, there is no review on this topic already. There is medical uncertainty surrounding you know, insulin, which is the safest type and what's the best way to administer it. Um, and basically that there's been a 50% increase in diagnosis of diabetes in people aged 40 years and younger. So this would include an awful lot of women of reproductive age. So this is why it's important to do the review. Then they want to know about preliminary work that you have done in um, preparing for the Cochrane Review. So this is where you'd say, yeah, we have our review title registered with the appropriate group. We have a review team that have all the expertise. We have the title registration form completed. And that, well, we kind of did a, a scoping search, but it's good to say that we did a scoping search and that it will predict the likely workload that you have just to see how many trials are out there. And actually in this one, I think we said we'd have 25 trials, um, but in the actual final review, there was only five that were eligible. So it's just here where you say that you've been doing work and that you are interested. And um, so we said we identified several randomized control trials. And then that I'd read chapters one to five of the Cochrane Handbook for systematic reviews. Okay. So just this is the preliminary work that you've been doing in preparation. And then um, I attended a two-day course as well, and they run it every year in Cork uh, on systematic reviews, and it's free to attend. So I'd attended that just a two-day course. And then John Brown does the uh, extra credit module on systematic reviews as well. So they were just all the things I was able to put in. So think of any courses that you've done and training and so on that's relevant. Then there's a section on the proposed benefit um, that the fellowship will have for the applicant and for the island of Ireland. <coughs> so different things that we that I put in in a way was that it would exp expand my knowledge and skill base in systematic reviewing. That hopefully they might be able to undertake additional Cochrane reviews in the future once I'd learned how to do one. That I um, had an interest in it and I completed a systematic review as part of my final year project and that hopefully the fellowship would benefit me in teaching and supervision of current and prospective students, and that I would be in a position to supervise undergraduate students in the future, and that I currently teach on the systematic review and meta-analysis module in the department, and that by doing this, I'd be gaining more new skills in systematic reviews, and that for my PhD, I conducted three systematic reviews um, with meta-analysis 
So being able to do a Cochrane review would be another skill. If these were on observational studies, the Cochrane review would be in clinical trials. Benefits for the island of Ireland. I said that diabetes is increasing globally. It remains a significant public health concern. And that, of course, um, uh, pregnant women with diabetes and their offspring have much worse outcomes. So we need to find out what's the safest type of insulin and the safest way of administering it. And um, so hopefully the current and um, prospective students will benefit from my teaching and supervision as a result of the fellowship in the Cochrane Review. Then you just have to fill in details about what group you're registered with and who is the editor that's been assigned to you. So you will get that when you get the email saying that your title has been approved and you've got to fill in all of that. Uh, then you have to fill in things about uh, how long you want the fellowship for. So you can have a ma for a maximum of two days a week. You might pick one day, it's up to you, but a max of two and for a max of two years. Um, and you have to put in your preferred start date and then uh, for allocation of time, you have to say how uh, the, there's, that there's arrangements in place that you will actually be given the time to do the review. So that's where you say that you've received formal agreement from your employer and that also that you have a local supervisor that's based in your host institution and that you plan to spend, like I said, I plan to spend one day a week for the first six months working on the protocol. And following this, I'll spend two to three days a week working on the review for the remainder of the fellowship. But this completely changes. I'd say the protocol took maybe two or three weeks, and then it was in review for six months. So you're waiting. You can't start the full review until the, the protocol has been published. So this varies as well. There will be weeks where you have nothing to do on the Cochrane review, and then there will be weeks where you have a lot. Then you just have to mention who your local supervisor is going to be and add in their details. If they're already in the online grant system, all of this will be there for you. If not, you'll have to fill it in. So you'll have to add in all their publications, grants, uh, any membership professional bodies, and research experience that's relevant to systematic reviews in particular. Um, and then if you are picking a supervisor that's not based on your institution, you have to say, describe the arrangements and how that's going to work out, basically. Then you just put in your employer's details and you'll need a letter of support from them saying that they agree to give you the two days a week to work on the review. And then for all your co-reviewers, I just put in the first one, you uh, fill in their details you fill in what experience they have that will help with the Cochrane review. So, for example, Paul Byrne had already conducted eight Cochrane reviews, so he was going to be very helpful. Um, and then one of the final things is you have to put together a dissemination and knowledge transfer plan. So, again, this is where you say that you're going to consult with the relevant Cochrane bodies to gain advice <coughs> about appropriate knowledge transfer and exchange strategies that you will contact the different groups, so the National Diabetes Advisory Groups, um, and that you will contact the Diabetes and Pregnancy Support Groups, media engagement, that um, we could follow guidance by the Cochrane Group and liaise with UCC's media department to obtain publicity for the review, and then healthcare professionals. So we just said that uh, Prof Kinney is a consultant obstetrician and director of the Irish Centre for fetal and neonatal research, and that she would provide the opportunity to present and disseminate the findings to other healthcare professionals and study days and uh, conferences and so on. Um, and then you have to come up with a budget, so here you're putting in your salary that you're requesting, um, and what I would say is just get help from the finance department with this. Um, Accounting's not my thing, so definitely just, or if there is a finance person in your department, like there is an infant, just ask them for help. But you have to justify your salary, so you can't just be finished your PhD and request a senior lecturer's salary. You would be going on point one of a postdoc, and they won't, you're not allowed increments. I don't think you're allowed increments yet, or, yeah. Well, it wasn't, so I applied two years ago, and may have just got a fellowship this year. So they don't allow increments, so you stay on the same salary point of the scale. 
and UCC's research salary scales were updated in January, so that's the link to that, and um, have a look at that. Then you have to um, put in Cochrane Review expenses for the two years. Um, again, you have to justify the expenses you're proposing, so stuff that we put in are like interlibrary loans, uh, travel for meetings in the UK, and you have 1,500 euros available to spend on this, these expenses, okay? Um, training costs, this is where you attend the different training courses. And again, for the two years for that, you have a maximum of 2,000 euros. And for the Cochrane Fellowship, you have to attend the RA13 Cochrane training courses. So these are like developing the protocol and conducting the Cochrane review. Um, and they're generally on in the UK, so you need to budget in your 2,000 euros for flights and accommodation in the UK. And they usually run RA1 and 2 together over two days, and then RA3 and 4 uh, over two days. Okay. Uh, so you, have to, you have to attend those and budget them for them. And then if you have any money left, make sure you use it up, because I think they under budgeted. And then the overhead contributions are 25% the direct costs. And then finally, you have appendices. So the two things you would have to have is the letter confirming that your title has been registered and a letter of support from your employer, OK? So what are the reviewers looking for? Um, when they're looking at your fellowship application. They want the suitable applicants. So just remember that this is a training fellowship and you don't have to be an expert in systematic reviews. They want a suitable review team who have the required expertise. So if you go in on your own with one other person and you don't have the expertise, that's possibly going to weaken your application. So just choose a good review team. You, if you have an important research question or topic, that goes a long way if you can justify why it's important. That helps. Um, then implications of the findings. So. Yeah. Who will be affected? What changes will be made? And who cares? And then your dissemination. So just make sure you identify in your knowledge and dissemination plan just the key organisations. So just look up, like I looked up some diabetes groups and some pregnancy support groups and stakeholders and uh, maybe identify in your Cochrane review expenses or your training expenses a conference that you could go to that would be suitable. Um, and definitely allow yourself enough time so to, to get your team together, to get your title, and remember that your title can take up to two months to register, okay? So if the call opens in March, if you don't have, you'd want to be getting your title right then, because it could take until May before it's approved, and then you have to apply online. Read the guideline documents, follow the instructions, Seek some advice from colleagues or the funding body, or if you want to ask me any questions about it, I'm available. And you know, go to the finance office or wherever for the budget. And then you also have to notify your host institution of your intention to apply. So it's UC Wallace and UCC. Uh, oh, am I for time? That's sounds fine for time, am I? Yeah. Okay. So I just had like five or six slides on our review. So this is just the. Uh, protocol of it and the full review is with the editors now and it should hopefully be published by the end of December so we're waiting to hear back from them but in the end after doing the whole Cochrane review we ended up with five trials <coughs> there was four open label multi-center two arm trials and one single center four arm trials in total in the five trials of only 554 women and babies and when we did our grade assessment, so this is like the risk of bias in the trials, all of the trials were deemed either high or unclear risk of bias. And this was mainly due to lack of blinding. But it's kind of hard to blind our uh, intervention here. But a lot of the reviews could have stayed blinded the outcomes and the outcome assessors, and they didn't, and they didn't report it. Then there was unclear methods of randomizations. An awful lot of the trials didn't have protocols. So we were unable to say whether they reported all the outcomes that they planned to. And some of the reviews would just say there was no significant difference and not present the results or the numbers. So then we couldn't do a meta-analysis, even though we had five trials, we couldn't do a meta-analysis because they all looked at a different comparison. 
and the majority of our predefined outcomes. So you're allowed to have seven outcomes in your grade tables, summary findings tables. Most of the reviews didn't even report these outcomes. So basically, we were unable to draw any firm conclusions on the best insulin type or regime as a result. But just to show you some of the trial results, the first trial was comparing insulin lispro with uh, regular insulin. There were only 33 women in the trial. And as you can see from our seven grade outcomes that macrosomia wasn't reported. There were no perinatal deaths. Um, cesarean section, the likelihood of a cesarean section was reduced in women taking insulin lispro, but it wasn't significant. And it was the same for preeclampsia again, but not significant and the fetal anomalies, and then there were no birth trauma events in the trials. And the composite measure of neonatal morbidity on that wasn't reported. So a lot of the outcomes either weren't reported or there were no events. The second trial was just comparing human insulin with animal insulin. There were only 42 people that were women in this trial. For macrosomia, again, they were saying it was reduced in women who took the human insulin, but it's not significant at all. And then all of the rest of the outcomes weren't reported in this trial. For our third trial, there was, so the third trial looked at um, two different comparisons. So the first comparison was comparing pre-mixed insulin with self-mixed insulin, and there were 93 women. And for macrosomia, again, a reduction, but not significant. Perinatal death wasn't reported. C-section, was reduced in the pre insulin, insulin group, but not significant, and the other four outcomes weren't reported. Um, this same trial then compared injecting insulin with a pin compared to a standard needle or syringe. Um, so again, the same outcomes uh, for macrosomia and caesarean section. And it was actually significant in this that if you injected with an insulin pin compared to a needle, that you were less likely to have uh, C-section. Then we had our fourth trial, which was comparing insulin aspart with human insulin. This was quite a large trial, 223 women compared to the other ones, but none of our seven grade outcomes were reported on it. Now there were secondary outcomes, but of the main outcomes that we wanted to look at, none of them were reported. And the final trial that we included was comparing insulin detimer with NPH insulin. And there are 162 women in this, and the only one of our outcomes that they reported were uh, fetal anomalies. And you can see from the confidence intervals that they're crazy, they're very wide. Uh, we're not finding or seeing a lot here. And then this is just an example of the risk of bias. Sorry for the big preview stamp through it, but once you submit it to the editors, it's locked into the system and you can't access um, it any further. So this is just showing that all of the yellow and red sections basically are saying it's either unclear risk of bias or high risk of bias. And for all of our trials, they were the majority of them either had a high or unclear risk of bias. There's very little green sections. And then I just want to acknowledge um, our review team and Dr. Paul Byrne for his help with applying for the fellowship and working on the protocol and then the Health Research Board for funding and the Pregnancy and Childbirth Group. That's it.